my left because my big monitor's here, and this is just the camera. So I just wanted to let you know that. All right. Okay, good. So, hello. My name is Prithvi Cyrus Christian. I am a 17 year old rising senior at uh, Western High School in Austin, Texas, in the US. And my research is in is a deep dive into the use of image processing and object detection to identify pneumonia. Okay, okay so an introduction to me is that I'm an eager high school student. I'm graduating next year, as I've stated, and I have an impressive academic record with a 4.0 GPA and a 6.0 uh, weighted GPA in all my IB computer science and math uh, courses. My various activities go from founding two nonprofits on teaching AI education globally and in Austin to underserved communities to my pioneering research, which I am having, which I have applied and am patent pending for a global patent in this research. And my determination and my work ethic that I've really tried to hone has really been the forefront of my research into trying to see what technology can do for our collective society. So just some background info, info of my interest into the project. So uh, last November, my grandfather passed away of pneumonia and I wanted to know what could I have done better? What could I have, uh, what could my family have done so then we could have detected pneumonia at a way earlier part of the process? And so that's when I came across this idea to see, okay, so pneumonia detection, right? How can I use machine learning to detect pneumonia? And so this changed my home is dynamic. And as there was very little research into this area and very low accuracy rates in this area, I really wanted to make sure I made something that could actually be of use. And what just happened? Um, okay, sorry, that was not... That was not supposed to happen. Um, one second. Okay, just sorry about that. So, and uh, one other big thing about pneumonia is that it kills 50,000 people every single year in the US. And it kills 2.5 million people every single year worldwide. And not many people talk about it. COVID-19 is talked about a lot. Um, and all these different diseases that have been coming up in the last few years, like uh, in the last decade, swine flu, uh, the Zika virus, all these different things have um, have pretty much been the forefront of news and NAMA treatment has come out. It's been pretty much the same levels of treatment. It's been hand hand diagnoses for the last for foreseeable past. And so it's not been efficient enough. And that's where I wanted to come in and make that change. So my problem statement is so challenges in early pneumonia diagnosis from chest x-rays, as I've stated already, doctors as of right now, they're using hand uh, pneumonia detection uh, detection ser services. And so it takes a long time. Like for my grandfather, it took, me, it took him three days to get a result on if he had pneumonia or not. My research does, seven, for, does 270 chest x-ray images in 70 seconds and will identify if the person based on that image has pneumonia or not, based on a lot of other factors like demographics, pat, uh, patient history, and a many others that are outlined in my paper. And the limitations of these existing deep learning appro uh, approaches that are right now, that are usually one model or two model uh, ensemble approaches or single approaches is that they don't capture all the relevant features and the important facts that are that you need like I'm doing where my ensemble model of three different AI models, machine learning models, are able to capture all the relevant features of the image, uh, taking the convolutional layers, the pooling layers, and the fully convolutional layers and, or connection layers, and being able to actually break down each image based on any size image and be able to break down the specific point using an arrow that was made in Seaborn SNS, the library, and being able to actually air, point out where that specific pneumonia is. So my research questions. 
how can on an ensemble of pre-trained CNN models, which I'm using, enhance pneumonia detection from chest x-rays? That was my main question. And then these are all the different sub-questions that came from it. So what is the optimal combination of these base learners for pneumonia classification, which is a more specific part, which will be shown in my model architecture? Developing a novel weighted average ensemble technique, which is shown in my patent, has uh, these two questions. How can multiple evaluation tech metrics be integrated to determine, to determine optimal classifier weights, which are covered based on precision, recall, F1 score, AUC specificity, et cetera, which will be more discussed in my architecture? And how does the proposed ensemble model compare so the conventional ensemble techniques, which are at about 90 to 92% accuracy, which is good, but mine does 98.81% accuracy, which is the highest I've, I've seen so far. So some important terms and uh, just definition and purpose of these terms. So the co convolutional neural networks for people who don't uh, know what that is, it, they're deep learning algorithms, which pretty much uh, process grid data on an image. And so, and I'm using images. And so the three parts of it, like I've already stated, are convolution convolutional layers, pooling layers, and fully connected layers. So the convolu convolutional layer will look at the input image and actually see, okay, where are the features and patterns? Because it's already pre-trained to know what, uh, through ImageNet, uh, the other uh, pre-trained model. And so it is pretty much scanning the image to see, okay, what are the features and patterns of pneumonia, right? Are there are there dark opacity areas in each features in each part of the image? And so then the pooling layers will break it down because there is not a set size for the image, like 256 by 256 or anything else. And so these image sizes that will be brought in will be broken down using these pooling layers to make sure that the models are able to identify the pneumonia in the definite spots and where it actually starts. So then doctors are able to fix that more quicker. And the fully connected layers will finally bring these two layers together and actually interpret the features uh, extracted from both of these. So then you can have a final classification if it actually has pneumonia or not. And so one of the terms I use deep transfer learning, but also transfer learning. This is an important part because I use 5,000 plus data points. And that's a lot, but comparatively to hospitals, comparatively to, comparatively to universities with research labs who have millions of data points and actual like hospitals who are giving them these data points. This is a, mine is a limited medical imaging data. And so, I'm utilizing pre-trained models on large data sets so I can solve similar problems on these smaller data sets that maybe don't have 100,000 data points or 50,000 data points when I have 6,000. All right, so the significance of the terms, right? So the importance of convolutional neural networks is that with these, um, in many past uh, works, on identifying COVID-19, on identifying uh, the whipping uh, cough, the swine flu, all these things in the last 10 years that have been there. And there have been a lot of research that utilizes these con convolutional neural networks to be able to actually tackle challenges in computer vision problems uh, throughout all sides of healthcare. And uh, also there are different uh, advantages that come with CNNs with the fact that there is an automated feature extraction system through the through three layers, which I detailed before, which really can help is smoothen out the efficiency and can have a 70 second um, output uh, with 270 images. And also there is the significance of deep transfer learning in pneumonia detection where because of this, uh, I am able to, like I stated already, allow leveraging knowledge from large data sets so then I can improve my performance on medical data sets that don't really have as much um, how many how much as much inputs. And as well, um, there is more 
uh, efficient training of deep learning models because of this deep, deep transfer learning. And I'm able to actually get a specific um, look at the uh, each of the data sets that I brought, which is one of the points I'll be bringing up in the future. So an overwork of the overall framework as of right now is that study employs a sophisticated weighted average ensemble technique, which is novel for model integration. So these two points are in my model architecture and I'll be detailing it later. And if you want any more info throughout any of this presentation, you can look at my uh, paper. And so the weights for each of the uh, yeah, the weights of for each of the base learners of for each of the three models, Google Net, ResNet, and DenseNet, which are the ones I used, were computed using the uh, performance metrics which I uh, implemented for each of the models. So there was ac there was accuracy uh, at the end. There's precision, recall, F1 score, AUCs, and all are based on a confusion matrix, which I will also be discussing more at, towards the end. And after these weights have been uh, I uh, computed then using a weighted probability score, ensemble probability score, which is calculated through a formula. There is a hyperbolic tangent to be able to actually generate the optimal weights that need to be for e uh, that need to be there for each classifier. And as well, the novel integration approach significantly uh, enhances the overall system performance as past research has not used three models or they've used three models and haven't been able to scale it as well as I have. And so that's where my novel approach comes in. And so the way the ensemble outperformed individual base learners with the singular um, method uh, performances and conventional ensemble methods as well achieve the superior accuracy and sensitivity, which I'll be detailing more in the future, but these specific numbers in 98 0.81% and a 96.2% sensitivity, which is higher than any other research that is there right now. And also the research methodology that is there is through the, like I've stated, the three powerful pre-trained CNN models, Google Net, ResNet, and DenseNet, which I will also be describing more in the future about how I actually decided on these. And so a uh, groundbreaking weighted average ensemble technique as I'm trying to re reiterate this because this is a very important part that the weighted average ensemble technique was computed and is very novel because one my performance metrics I have the most performance metrics out of any single research in this area that I could find I'm using five different performance metrics that uh, most others will use only three and I feel like that also contributes to the weighted average ensemble technique, which is increasing my actual uh, metrics. As well, uh, the methodology uh, demonstrated exceptional um, challenges that were throughout the whole project. As I used the two diverse public data sets, the Kermini data set used about 5,000 plus data points. The RSNA challenge data set used about 1,500 data points, and 1,500 is way less. So that also contributes to the RSNA data sets, um, lower uh, metrics as well. Uh, these two data sets, I am using the most, uh, besides two other researchers who have used two data sets, but did not use as much data as me, or wasn't able to scale it with the uh, overall three ensemble models. And the comprehensive five-fold cross-validation was employed, which is the confusion matrix, which I'll be detailing in a future slide. Also, uh, you can look more on my paper. So the data collection, uh, like I said, uh, the Kermini data set contained about 5,856 extra images from uh, children aging from before one years old to 100 years old and further as well. The RSNA uh, pneumonia detection data set provided a larger scale of medical imaging resource as even though it wasn't as big as the 5800, there are a lot of other data, data sets that are even less than that amount. So this was very important for me to have. 
as well. Uh, these data sets were carefully selected to ensure robust uh, medical development and evaluation as both uh, give me a more thorough uh, representation of how the models actually work to get actual uh, generability and applicability and to be able to see, okay, what does this, what, how do these models work and do these models actually work on a larger amount of data? As well, the data sets allowed for more thorough testing because I was able to look at more patient demographics, more clinical presentations, as well as more patient history to be able to apply to my models. So this was actually the proposed approach. So like I stated before in the image on the right, you can see here, the this is an image of the Kermney data set on a past uh, researcher's attempt. So you can see here, yes, there is this splotch of white. It's pretty obvious to see there's a splotch here, right? You can tell here and you're thinking, oh, this is gonna be easy, right? And then you see this part, this part B and you're thinking maybe this is easier because they're, look at this so much pneumonia here. However, however, these, this area, yes, there's a lot of, there's definitely pneumonia here, but where does it actually start, right? Where does the pneumonia actually start from here, right? And where does the fluid buildup actually um, commence? And so that is where my four arrows, based on the Seaborn SNS library, which I um, implemented for this, uh, comes into play on Google Colab. And so I was able to point out the specific areas, which is my probably most novel approach to the whole research as no one else has done this before. And this has been revolutionary for places like in India where they might not have the specific technology to actually pinpoint this exact point, which is one of my future works to get it to places like that. And so, like I said, uh, the... A proposed approach as I use these three models and were fine tuned for chest extra classification, initially trained on the image net um, uh, model. And so the uh, deep transfer learning strategy uh, significantly improved my model performance, uh, which was exactly shown through my performance metrics, as well as uh, all the layers, which I will be showing in a graph on a future slide based on the frozen layers of each ensemble model and then the specific models to see how the frozen layers actually compare as well. Uh, all layers of the base models were unfrozen during training uh, to optimize performance. So then I was able to actually go through the four steps of uh, data pre-processing from and model training for, so excuse me, from initialization to training to actually evaluating it then testing it on the actual test set. So this is my model architecture. Uh, the image is not as clear as, a, as I would like it to be, but if um, you want more of a clear photo, there is a more clear photo on my actual paper. And so you look at the input image, which is the input face. These are the three different models. And so you are going through a seven by seven uh, convolutional layers um, in each of these, uh, followed by you have your pooling layers, and then your um, uh, oh yes, uh, my uh, excuse me for a second, uh, this was low, this was loading, and the response normalization uh, blocks, as you can see here, and then finally you have your inception blocks which are in each of these. You have connections here, inceptions here, and then you're using transitional layers here between dense blocks, fixing downsampling in the dense net because you're trying to make sure that the fully connected layers are actually uh, able to be used uh, for classification. And uh, I'm doing this for time, but if you want a more deeper uh, definition of each of these, you can go see my paper. Uh, using the base learners, using deep transfer learning. And as I was saying before, the four um, metrics uh, specifically that were used besides specificity, specificity were precision, recall, F1 score, and AUC for each of the models. And as well, uh, the confusion matrix, which I'll be showing in the future slide, was able 
to um, calculate each of these through true positive rates fault, and false positive rates and overall positivity rates. And after these performance metrics were there, the hyperbolic tangent was able to compute the weights as um, the weights were computed based on each, huh, each of the uh, performance metrics. And as well, after this point, the computed ensemble the uh, probability score was computed based, as you can see here, the W here was computed specifically on these weights. And then the final prediction was made if it was actually pneumonia or a normal image. And so this is my later image. So the model training phase was overall. So all of these different steps. And so let's go through these images first real quick. So the variation accuracy with number of frozen layers on the Kermity data sets, as you can see here, the frozen layers on both of these, you can see a definite increase based on the Kermity data set because it has more data points because the images have a lot more pneumonia images. I'm able to get a lot more accuracy. And so the ensemble score obviously had a, um, a very uh, superb uh, performance compared uh, in the uh, RSNA data set. And then as you can see here in this first step, the Atom Optimizer was selected based on uh, its performance in this optimizer selection, but the atom optimizer scored the highest uh, amount base, uh, based on the ensemble model. And all of these are where my different steps of model training, fine tuning the pre-trained models, going through the confusion matrix, utilizing data augmentation techniques, as well balancing the class weights, monitoring multiple evaluation metrics, which I've already stated, and saving the best performing model iterations at 270 epochs in 70 seconds. And so it was a very important part. And you can see more info on my paper. And so another step of model training, as you can see here, uh, the same image is here. And also, uh, these are the five different models which I used for my uh uh for the research and i tested all five of these uh i looked at these graphs which identify the actual validation training chance and best epochs and this was one of the models that i used the dense net 121 as it performed the best significantly compared to any other uh model and as well these are just the different um metrics uh, so you have your accuracy, you have your recall, precision, F1 score, ROC curve, which is one of the uh, statistics I ran, the confusion matrix, cross-validation scores, uh, comparison with baseline models, and then comparison with state-of-the-art methods, which are the different, um, also the different models that I used and the different techniques used in the past. And I apologize for not going into too much detail here, but I want to make sure I can complete this presentation and you can look at more on my paper. So it's a good idea. So my experiment set up just real quick talking about it. So developing an innovative ensemble framework for automated pneumonia detection uh, using chest X-ray images, utilizing three state-of-the-art pre-trained uh, CNN models as base learners, implementing a novel weighted ensemble technique, which is one of the parts of my patent, employing two diverse public data sets was also novel because not many people have used it as thoroughly as me and evaluating the model overall model performance using the confusion matrix, which generates detailed metrics using true positive and false positivity rates. So this is one of the statistics that I ran just talking about it. Uh, they make Neymar test talking about the two dependent variables here as the results likely showed statistical significance because as you all know, the statistical significance rate is a 0 0.05 p-value and under is statistically significant. And as you can see, each of these data points in the Kermini and RSNA data sets are 0 0.05 and under. However, the, the Kermini, da Kermini data set obviously has an overall better performance as it has a 0 0.0000 p-value and a 0 0.002, even though the RS ResNet has a 0 0.043, the two of the other models have already outperformed it on the actual Kermini data set as well. Each of these 
or showing statistical significance. And my two other statistical tests, as I've already stated, were uh, the ANOVA test, which demonstrated consistent performance uh, on the different cross-validation folds and uh, showed the same results as the uh, McNemar test with a p-value of less than 0.05 and is statistically significant. As well, the ROC analysis reported a very high AUC score as in the Kermit data set, it had a 98.2%, uh, my mistake if I said 96.2 in the past, and 86.7% accuracy on the RSNA challenge data set, which overall shows that my data was very statistically significant and actually has a purpose based on those. And so quickly talking about the confusion matrices here, you see the high accuracy rates suggested that confusion matrices shows the high performance of true positive and true negative rates as the highest numbers were true positive and true negative rates. And as well, as I said before, the all the different metrics were based on these rates. So like formulas like true positive plus uh, uh, false positive over all positive data points would equal precision. And so things like that were based on this confusion matrix, which can be detailed more in my paper. Also, as you can see here, the no, this is the highest amount of true positive, and then this is the high amount of, or this is the highest amount of true positive, this is the highest amount of true negative. We're trying to limit the amount of false positive and false negative. And so the results, just quickly talking about them, uh, as you can see here, uh, sorry about the image quality. The best models, Google Net, Dead Design, and ResNet, all had about 98% um, on each of the different performance metrics. This is accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, and AUC compared to the RSNA data set, which had comparative, comparatively less uh, performance. And as you can see here, 98.81% accuracy. And also the VGG16, as you saw on one of my past slides, the graph. Uh, was the next best model at 95% accuracy. However, um, using the confusion matrix, the it only had a positivity rate of around 82% compared to my 99%. So definitely my ensemble model was a better choice. And so my conclusions with my future works. So designed a model using uh, image processing to create 99% accuracy, precision, and recall. Uh, I did not build any physical product. I was using Google Colab the whole time. So thanks for that. Uh, this model was tested on a couple thousand dot, uh, chest X-ray images using the Kermity data set. And as well, my research shows that the Kermity data set is better for this because of the data points and really shows how much the amount of data points really makes a difference in your research for ML. And finally, my future works with this bullet point here. I'm trying to make sure that uh, global hospitals have this research. So giving this research to different places like in India or in uh, Africa, where they don't have this research um, would really help them. And actually, I can see the difference where in America, this research is going to come eventually, but there the research could never come maybe. So me actually being able to give this to them and work with them on this and implement this would really show that overall uh, actual like significance. And also, like I said, I'm having uh, a patent made on this. I have presented this on podcasts like the Inventors Helping Inventors podcast, and really just trying to make sure that I show how much this project means to me and my family and how much I can help people worldwide and actually bring more accurate pneumonia detection to the world and actually save more lives in the process. Thank you. And